USD is so damn flexible that you can see the worst thing ever being made without knowing because USD is never going to complain. Like USD is magic. It never complains about anything, even if you do the worst thing. So you have to be very, very careful about how people do stuff because sometimes they will do weird things and it's, it can be really hard to track. So I would say that's the biggest issue, like too flexible. Hi, and welcome to the TT Meetup. My name is Alexander Richter. I'm a technical director for visual effects, animation, and games. And I work at companies like WetFX and Framestore on Avatar The Way of Water and Monsters at Work. Welcome everyone to the TD Meetup. My name is Alexander Richter, and today we are on the topic of USD for visual effects. And I'm not alone today. I will be presenting with Bertrand Cabrol, who is with me today. And he is the Environment Technical Supervisor at DNEC. He worked on projects like the Blade Runner and Deadpool 2. And he is the one who basically brought me a little bit to this idea. We met at the FMX and he mentioned how important USD is and that I should do something like Python for USD or something in that category. And so I thought like, it's a great idea. So why not include it into our TD Meetup? So that's why we do this together. If you don't know who I am, my name is Alexander Richter. I'm a technical director and coach for visual effects, animation and games. And I was working on Avatar The Way of Water, Shang-Chi and the Ten Rings and Monsters at Work. So how we thought about today, if you ever was in a previous TD Meetup, for example, then we just break it down. So I will do the introduction, introduce the whole concept of USD and why USD is important, then give over to Bertrand about he would look into the practical field, more of an example. How do you actually use it when you see it in the DCC, in the software? And then at the end, we do a quick Q&A with me and him. And then we will open this Q&A up for everyone. So you can ask us questions to make sure that you get an understanding of what USD actually is. The goal of today is basically to make you understand what USD is and where USD could fit in your production life, in your future. Even if you are basically, either you are want to use it yourself and want to bring it into your studio, into your workflow, or in the future when you encounter it, you know what it is, how it works, and where to use it basically in your life. Most people here are total novice, so probably you heard USD. So that's perfect, because that's, that's what this event is about, is for basically newcomers to make sure that everyone understands USD and knows where this could fit in the future for you. The big question that we want to answer here is, what is USD and why should I use it? So I was asking myself this question and this is what I got. This is something from the official website and I will just read it so we are on the same page. USD stands for Universal Scene Description. It is a system for encoding scalable, hierarchically organized static and time sampled data for the primary purpose of interchanging and augmenting the data between cooperating digital content creation applications. USD also provides a rich set of composition operators, including asset and file references and variants that let consumer aggregate multiple assets into a single scene graph while still allowing for sparse overrides. First time I read that, I was like, what? What does that mean? I have no clue. And, and that is probably a little bit what we talked about when I talked with Bertrand about this, is probably the biggest problem of USD. It's very unclear what it means. And all the documentation, all the explanations are very complex and like, you know, embedded into this language of everything and nothing kind of. So let's break it down a little bit easier. First thing, what is USD? USD is an acronym for Universal Scene Description. And if we start first with scene description. A scene description is basically a file that saves everything that's inside the scene. If you think about a Maya file, what does it do? It saves 
what objects are in there, where they are, what attributes do they have. It describes a scene. So a saved file in Maya and Houdini and Nuke basically describes a scene and then builds it up. So we load it, so it builds up the scene. So that's what basically a scene description basically does. A save file is a scene description. The big difference here is the universal. So the universal is basically for the global general. It's independent. Independent where you are, independent of Maya, independent of Houdini, it should seem, describe the scene. And that's a little bit the, the whole idea of USD is to be a scene description that is independent of the environment of the software that we are. So basically, USD is a file format. And we even have like three formats that we have, three extensions. USD A, which is the human readable UTF-8 text, which you can manually read and update. It actually looks like this. If you ever worked with a JSON file or something like that, this, this is not very surprising. So we can literally read that and manipulate, if even necessary, manually. Then we have USDC, which is random access create binary. So it's binary code. We cannot read it, but it's faster in rendering, could be slower in terms of saving, for example, when we update it. And then we have the USD itself, which basically is can be both. It's just a, just the extension USD, but it can be like the human readable or random access binary. But USD is much much more, and that's what what we want to talk about today. That's why we are looking into USD because there is just more than just the file format. First thing. We want to compare USD to the other file formats that we have, because that's the first step that we want to look at. So we know OBJ, we know Alembic, and we know FBX. And if we look at them from the point of view of shading, lighting, interoperability, which means how can this format work between different DCCs? Can I use it in Maya and then use it also in Max? And then non-destructive overrides, which means if I change something, can I go back or is it gone forever? So if we look at OBJ, it's basically cannot do none of the three. And if you if you know OBJ, for example, if you move it from, from Maya to Max, for example, what can happen? The axes are turned. And then you are flipping the the maybe the, the Z and the X axis, and suddenly everything is flipped. If we look at Alembic, for example, it's pretty interoperability. We can use it everywhere. We can take an asset from Maya and then bring it into Houdini and it will work. But shading, lighting, and non-destructive overrides are basically non non-existent. And last but not least is FBX, which is basically more on shading and lighting, but also not really, really strong when it comes to it. So it has the option, but very much with quotation. What USD gives us, all of them. It allows us to use it in shading. It allows us to use us in lighting. It allows us to use interoperability, which means we can transform and move it between different DCCs. And it's non-destructive overrides. That means we can remove certain elements that we override before and go back to a previous state. If you think about it, USD is a file format and it's universal. Since we can use it in different departments, as we just noticed, shading, lighting, modeling, wherever, and we can use it in different DCCs. Maya, Max, Houdini works fine. At the same time, it allows integration. So we can use plugins that allow to integrate Alembic, Material X, and even other file formats. So we can basically use USD as something, as a collection, basically, even of other formats. So it doesn't have to be its own format. It can also collect others. The other part of USD that's really good is performance. So fast loading time, that's the focus of, of the developers, and low latencies with multi-threading and GPU. That means the file is always focused on opening fast, saving fast, but also when you're working with it, the performance is fast. That is that's a very important part of USD. The other part is collaboration. USD has something called layers. Layers allow artists in different departments to work on the same scene at the same time and layer them, basically, which allows a better collaboration than usual, where you have one maybe file that everyone has to share to some degree. We have variation, which allows us to introduce new variation of an object. If you think about it, for example, let's say you have a character with different clothing. So you have a rainy version of the clothes, a dirty, a broken, a blue, a red version of the clothes, 
And you can just switch between the variation by just changing an attribute instead of literally importing and reapplying its elements. And then for last but not least, it's programmable. So we can access the C++ libraries using Python. Okay, let's look into it. So first one is about layers. So if you think about something like this, this scene here of this mountain and with greenery, how would we build it in our usual form? You would probably create a shot or a scene and then put everything together, import everything, reference everything, and so on. USD ha has a little bit of a different option that is similar to reference, but not the same, which is layer. So what we can do, we can la layer each element on top of each other. And you should think it more as, a, as the layers in Photoshop. So we can also control how much it layers, how, how much basically the opacity to some degree is, which is op opinions and stuff like that. So we can basically control how we layer. And we can also control if we want to basically mute or remove an element from that layer. There is so certain elements that sound a little bit like what we do at the moment, but at the same time, they're more independent. So all these layers are basically could be different files that we put together to a new shot. So if we, for example, work on a certain shot, we can have different layers and different USD files that will add up to the whole shot. We can have literally a layer for the camera, the camera USD. We can have a layer for the lighting, lighting USD, and for the animation. And the cool part about is not only do we have different layers for different, like for example, departments, or even in the same department, different layers, we can use this from different software. We can literally do a parallel cross-platform working. For example, let's say we animate our scene in Maya and we light the scene in Katana, but we build it together as a shot independent from the software. So we can use different software, diff create different layers in different departments and put them together in one scene, in one shot and use that. And they will still work because as we learned, it's universal scene description. So it doesn't really matter if, if which software opens. As long as it provides the USD connection, we can open it and use it in there. And that also applies to the renderers, basically. The other part is variation. So one of the things that we always struggle with is we always have this element of different variation of things. As I mentioned before, let's say we have a different version of the model. We'd have different version of the shaders and textures and so on. And usually what we need to do, we need to replace the textures, we need to replace the attributes, we need to redo everything. USD gives us basically attributes that we can modify. So we can basically link certain elements together so we can switch between different variation, which allows us to have a little bit more of a streamlined version of variation. Instead of manipulating it or importing or referencing additional elements, we can basically connect elements together to variation and then just switch between variation depending on our needs. And last but not least, for my part at least, USD is basically open USD, which means it's an open source project on GitHub. You can literally download it today and you can modify it even, even. If you have the experience in programming, you can literally modify it and you can connect and merge with other repositories if there's a different version even of USD that maybe has some tweaks that you like, or you can create your own version where you tweak it to some degree that is necessary for your own production. And that way you can also contribute to the progress of USD, not only in your company, but even worldwide and add to the standards. For example, you can integrate it into a software that it doesn't exist at the moment. So that would be a way to like open up this basically format for everyone. That was the basic introduction. Hopefully that was clear at what USD in general is, what it means and how it works in the abstract way. Let's look a little bit more into how you would use USD in a production, basically. Hi, everyone. So I'm, I'm just going to give a little bit more context. Obviously, I can't explain how everything about USD. It's a lot of work to do that. So, But I, I'm going to give you a little bit of context in how it works in production, why we use it, etc. So the good thing with USD, as uh, Alexander said, is the fact that it's a file format, but it's a way to, it's the way we describe scenes. So instead of having, when you have a scene like this, and as you can see, you have a camera, you have lighting, 
you have an environment, you can imagine that this is FX, this kind of stuff. All of those information are just translating into multiple files for every part of it. And it's just one file, it's just USDA, uh, it's one format, so it's super useful. And at the end of the day, because everything in USD can be referenced or sublayered into other USD, so how it works is that all of this is then referenced into this island.usda. And at the end of the day, what we load and what we render is this island2.usda, which is super easy to work with. The reason why we use this is, as I said, the fact that we can open it anywhere. And I know that this might not seem that important, but it actually is because the way we used to work in production is that you would do some, some part of the workflow it would be in Maya because you would do usually animation would be in Maya, uh, reading potentially because of all the scripting and everything. And maybe you would do environment and FX in Houdini. And you had to somewhat translate whatever you're doing into the software where you're rendering. And when you get into this software, you will need to have new process to maybe do the material, how you assign them. But it wouldn't be part of the asset that you were doing. So if I was doing an FX and I wanted to have this FX and each shader live together, usually it would be pretty hard to do with what how we were working before. Now, what USD allowed us to do is that now we can have everything living together. So in this example, you can see that the lines, which is like the FX, which is this thing here, live inside of one asset. So I have this asset effect and it has the material, it has the curves in this case, and they all live together. And it's really great to work this way because it means that every asset you work with, they are all safe contained. And when you need them somewhere else, you can just call them and you can do whatever you want with them. It also means that because we work in USD, what you have at the end of the day, what you send to the renderer is a USD file. So if you have the proper tools to generate this USD, in theory, you can make them anywhere you want, which is really helpful because it means that instead of having a bunch of tools and process that are going to take a bunch of different data, put them together into one scene file, you actually just have this scene file already pre-made for you. And it also means that you can do whatever change you want, which is also a very powerful aspect of USD. You have materials, lighting, models, instancers, but you also have rendering paths, you have cameras, you can basically have everything you might need to in production. The flow of USD, it's before it would look like this, as I was saying, you would do maybe in Houdini, you might do models, maybe you do shaders, animation, camera, you would do some kind of processing, some format, send it to Maya, let's say to for rendering. Maybe you would use other software, this kind of stuff. The flow of USD is way simpler. And it's actually not accurate that I do it this way, where I have shaders, model, animation, camera, and I output a USD. Because in general, how we work is in Udini, we work in USD directly. And actually, if I show you, yeah, you see it. If I show a USD, this is a USD right now. This is a stage. So USD is a stage, and this stage is made of multiple layers. And what you see here, and whatever work I might be doing in this scene, like adding a camera, this is actually modifying the stage directly. So if I output this, I have a USD, and we are working in USD. So you really don't have as much as a, oh, I need to export my file, begin somewhere else, blah, blah, blah. You just work in USD, and that's it. So that's how it works. It's the same idea with how we do asset now. So what you might have, before is if you're working on some asset, here I'm saying a tree could be anything, a character or whatever, you would do step by step in general. You would have modeling, you would have texturing, you would have shading. Now I'm not saying that you would never change like a step. If you get to the shading, maybe the modeling might change in this kind of thing. If you're working in ringing animation, you might change a step, but usually how it would work is that every time you have to change a step, you would actually have to, you know, recook something. You would have to bring back the model. Maybe you would have to update the texture, or maybe you would have to update the shader, 
this kind of thing. And you would end up with like steps of assets. So you would have model.lambic and then it would go to asset dot whatever format you use, et cetera, et cetera. The cool thing with USD is that everything is referenced and everything is composed together, which is an important term in USD. So the idea is that whenever you have an asset or a scene or whatever, it's always the same workflow in the sense that you have a bunch of layers together. So now how we work usually is that you have an asset like a tree, you will do a layer for the shading, you might do a layer for the texture, a layer for the modeling, and a layer for rigging and animation, let's say. And the cool thing with this is that instead of having to work on an asset or work on something, you can basically take the asset itself, work on one of the layer of the asset, change it, and then everything is composed together. Sometimes it will break for sure, because if you change the model and you change the UVs, your texture will break, that's logical. But the USD itself will work. You will still have your asset. It's just that the texture won't match it anymore. And it's an important aspect of USD because in production, when you are in big studio, usually modeling, shading, lighting, all of those steps are into, made into different departments. And it's way better to not have to wait for the previous department to start your work, to do your work, because if you think about it, there are a lot of things you can do without having to wait for someone. So how does it work? We talked about players. So a stage, which is the final result, is kind of like the cake and the layers are basically the ingredients for your stage, right? So the stage is the result of composing X amount of layers. You might have a thousand layers, you might have only one. Into you have layers, you might reference a other USD file. The layer can affect anything that comes under it, and it's called composition. What it means is that if I have, let's say I have a tree, and this tree comes as an asset, he has three layers, one for model, one for shading, and one for, I don't know, uh, animation. If you want to, since the model is the layer before the shading, let's say, you can add a, top, a change in the look depth shader, and it's going to change the shader on the model. But it also means that if I bring this asset somewhere, I can add another layer on top of it and affect whatever I want to change. And that's something that is really powerful in USD, is that you're not bound to where you want to do changes. If you were to work with an alambic, you know that like if I bring an alambic, usually you can't like change the alambic itself. You would have to go back to the scene that made the alambic change the alambic and republish. In USD, you don't have to do that ever. You can simply take the model, which could be an alambic, by the way, and you can completely override the model in a top layer. And it's really powerful and it's non-destructive, which is the next one. And it's really important. I just want to mention, even if you can make every single change into a new layer, you could change and you could have an infinite amount of layer. Usually we try to not do that too much because it gets complicated and heavy, and it's hard to track issues, but we do use it in some cases. So to the picture that I show, I'm just gonna show you quickly how it would look. In this case of the mountain again, like the terrain would be a layer, the shading would be another layer, and then the, let's say, instancing would be another layer. And that's how we work usually. Me, I'm environment, so, you know, it's easy to me to say that. We take all of this together and that gives us a result. What this means is that you have a lot of, you know, different stuff you can do. And it's some of those stuff is the fact that you can remove part of your editing. So in this case, I have this terrain and I've made a layer where I do like a river likes thing. And I put all of this together. If I wanted to in USD, I could say, oh, I don't want to have this river for a particular shot. And by doing this, I will get still the look dev working, but I won't have the river. And it's why it's so powerful to use USD because you can really control what you want to do. And the amount of changes you want to put in a layer is up to you. Now, here I'm showing a, an extreme example where every step of the terrain is a layer. 
You could do that if you want. We usually don't do that because that's way overkill, but just be aware that you could if you wanted to. So just to show you in production how we work, how you might work. In DNEG, we have a, the asset like I showed this to at the FMX, but we have the every asset that we make are a USD asset, and they all have layer for the different steps. And you can choose which kind of layer you want to make. So if I'm doing an asset that is supposed to be like a tree, usually we would have a model layer, we would have a look dev layer, and we would have a lighting layer. So if we do a car, then we are able to add lights to the car. And it's very powerful because it means that we can work on the model, the look dev, and the lighting at different steps. It also means that we can provide different assets based on what we're trying to do. So if we do a car, we would have lighting layer. But let's say I work on a tree. I don't expect to have lighting, so I just have a model layer and a look dev layer. On the other end, if I want to put the trees and the car together, I will do what we call an assembly in USD, which is based basically an assembly of assets. And we just provide a component layer because we don't need to have anything else. But any company can choose to put whatever they want into the asset. And what's really important and also a good reason why companies now use USD is that if I were to send my USD to another studio, it will work for them. And that's a big difference compared to what we had before, because every company had some kind of structure, some kind of format that were specific to their company. So whenever you would send something to another studio, you would have to find a way to give the data without giving your pipeline, which is basically impossible. With USD, you don't have to do that because now the software takes care of understanding USD while well before we had to make the software understand, which is, you know, way better for us. As I was saying, it's giving an, a place for the artist to work. If I make a tree, I have the model layer and I have the look dev layer. Once they're put together, I get my tree that is, you know, look dev. Beautiful tree, by the way. As I was saying, you don't need to work on the model itself. So if you have an artist working on the tree, but the model is not done yet, it doesn't matter. You can do your look dev on some random models, put it into the layer, and the assignments will be done automatically if you've made the proper rules. And then you will end up with your tree. Once the model is available, you will end up with your tree. So it's really powerful. And the other aspect of this is that you can have more layers and you can have variants. So if I were to have this tree and I want to have a case where the tree doesn't have leaves, for example, instead of having to republish another asset that is the same asset but without the leaves, I can take the same asset and just make a layer that removes the leaves and I can choose when I want to use this layer. Or I can, even easier than this, I can do what we call variants. So when we do variants, it's basically a variant of the asset. What does it do? Depends on your asset. Here, I'm removing the leaves, but I could do also a variant where I don't have a shader and I have no leaves too. So it really depends what you want to do. It depends how you want to work, which is kind of confusing with USD. It's something you have to think about. If you ever get to a point where you work in USD in production, be aware that the way they work might not be the way you've seen it on internet. The reason why is because there are a lot of ways of doing the same thing in USD. You can do layers, you can do variants, you can do a reference, you can do payloads. So just be aware of it. USD is very complex because it's very flexible, too flexible probably. So how does that translate? We talked about asset work, but how does that translate into shot work? Let's say I have an environment, I have all those shots, and I might have some edit to do in some of those shots. Well, the idea is I don't want to redo the environment every time, because if I redo the environment every time, it means a lot of data. It means that a lot of, I have a lot of work. I would need to load the proper environment in the proper shot, etc. So that's where USD shine too. What I'm doing here is I'm removing some random trees. Here I'm doing a square. Here I'm doing a bend. Here I'm just changing the shader. And here 
I'm taking the layer from this one and I'm adding it with the layer of this one. And that's something that you can do in USD. And all of this is non-destructive, meaning if I disable those two layers, I'm back to this. And that's extremely powerful, obviously, because you never have to make a new asset if you don't want to. And also it means that it's very light because the change you do, it depends on the change, but some change, they are mostly sparse. So instead of like, if I have this whole instancer, for example, and I'm removing half of the trees, I'm not doing a new instancer. I'm just filling an array saying, oh, I want those trees to be invisible. And it's very light. It's because there is no data in here. It's just like a bunch of ideas. So it's very powerful for this. The thing I wanted to flag is that like how USD is great is because it's great also for the tools. And I showed this too at the FMX. It's some tool that I, uh, we've made to make some layout for artists, which sounds very simple. But the good thing with this is that it gives a lot of power to the artist to work with. And all of this works in, is made with Python. You could do it with C++ too, it doesn't matter. C++ is supposed to be faster, but to be fair, Python is really fast with USD. And all of this, the layout and everything, is a little bit of, you know, Houdini API and how it works, but it's also USD API. So when I add trees, when uh, you see they come with their shaders and everything, it's because I'm manipulating the stage itself, the USD itself. So I'm, I'm able to use the variants, for example, which I'm doing here, I'm switching variants. And all of this is available thanks to USD because USD gives a very powerful API that means that you can do everything in USD. And it's, it's really great when you make tools. If you're someone that makes a lot of tools, it's really, really nice to do that. And it also means that, as you can see, all the layout, they're done directly into the renderer. And why are they made in the renderer? Because it's just a USD. So I can have all the information from the USD with the lights and everything, the shaders, and I can do my the layout at the same time. So it's very nice for this kind of stuff. Now, I just want to show why we always talk about universal scene description. As we said, we can open it ev everywhere, but it's also like the API is obviously universal too. So most of the software today the way they work is they have some kind of interpreter of the stage. They just take a USD file and they give, they give you a stage to work in. So here I have a simple tool, which is a tool I made for a friend who is working in Intelligent. And he wanted to be able to do some layout in USD in Houdini and make a file for Intelligent. Intelligent doesn't have support for USD, so I had to do something custom. But the code, here, that you can see, this is the code for Houdini. This takes a stage in Houdini. It takes all the instances that are placed, and it's going to take this, it's going to make a custom file, and it's using the USD API. So you can see USD Geom to get the transform, how to get the primitive, how to get the children, etc. This is all USD. The same tool to do the exact same thing in Maya, that's the only difference. What you have here, that's the only difference. Everything else is the same. And the only difference comes from the fact that getting the stage in Maya and getting the stage in Houdini is not the same process. So that's why it's very nice because when you work in USD, you can actually make tools for different ID at once. And we have a bunch of tools like this, like we have Frostum calling this kind of stuff that works into basically every ID that supports USD. So it's great to work, but it's also great to make some development. Now, if you're interested into how USD exactly works, all of this is the term and concept that you should know about when you work in USD. Now, that's the general one. You don't need to know all of them, obviously. And without context, it's going to be a little hard for you. But it's a great place to, you know, have a look, understand exactly how things work and just get used to, you know, the terms. Now, the API itself, if you're interested, it's a C++ API. They didn't do a Python 
API. So basically, you have to read this one and interpret it as Python. I mean, they have a Python API, but they don't have the documentation. The documentation for C++ is great, but it's, you know, like it's C++, so you have to get used to it. If I can advise you to, there is something called USD Survival Guide, which is a website where they give some examples for Python and how to work with it. And it's really a great reference if you want to do some uh, Python. I just wanted to show you a little bit. So, you know, like I was saying that we have a, just a stage, you know, and so that's the stage rendering right now. And this is all the primitive that I have. So this is the instancer for the trees. I have the terrain, I have the effect, and I also have my lighting. I have some render paths, this kind of stuff. So that's the stage. And if you look the layers, you will see the layers. So you will see that, for example, my model layer has my model for the tree. It also has the shader, and that's my tree asset. That's my terrain asset. And the way it works is that if I were to update my tree, I would see the update directly here because I would update my tree, right? And that's why it's very nice to work with this. So if I were to override an asset, I don't know if it's going to pick it up. Yeah, as you can see, it changed my scene. Why? Because I changed the tree. Everything is composed together. Now I have a different scene and I remove the shader. So you can see how very flexible it is because everything still works. It's very nice for this to work with USD because everyone can work together. The cool thing too, which is something I, I didn't mention, is there is a process in USD, which is the resolver. And basically it allows you to, because we never work like this, I think we can all agree in production, you don't override your file. That's a really bad idea. If you guys are doing it, stop doing it. So they have what's called a resolver, where if I ever, you can give him a process, if he has a version five, and now he has a version six, USD will automatically pick the version six. So you don't even need to, if I update my tree, which is referenced into an instancer, which is referenced into an environment, I don't need to update the different steps. All I need to do is update my tree, it will update everywhere. My break your renders, you will deal with all this when you get there. So yeah, that's basically the gist for USD. There is a lot to know. But uh, yeah, just uh, it gives you an idea of how to work with it. Thank you very much. I just also posted the links. Uh, you can find it in the chat, including the U USD survival guide. Just a few references before we move on to the Q&A and the meetup part. I uh, recently had this talk with Steve Eglund from Animal Logic, and we were talking about also their USD pipeline at Animal Logic. The main thing that we, like external piece of tech that we're heavily invested in is USD. The whole Animal Logic pipeline is built around USD now. And our lighting tool that we built is sort of based on everything is USD. The scene that comes in, the file format that we, that we build our graphs in, is kind of like Katana, but is written in USD, like encoded in USD. That it's it's rare to find someone who's had a lot of experience with USD. It's still pretty new, and I don't know if it's worked its way into curriculums. I think it works its way in the curriculums as it works its way in most companies. It's like people talk about it. People say it will be next month in, in, integrated, and then a few years later, it's still in the. I, usually, I'm happy if if someone is just knows the basics if mm. they if they've read you know the first page of the <laughs> the docs or something like that. Okay. Um, because not ma not many people have had a chance to work uh, deeply with, and we've all had to learn on the fly. He was also referring to this Animal Logic A Lab open source scene. So it's basically a USD scene with a lot of assets. So if you are interested to just like see how a scene can look like in a in a in a certain complexity. This is a scene you can literally download, look around, open the files, and so on. So that's also something I use when I start to look into that. Also recommend to, to watch the episode because we also talk to some degree about USD as part of the lighting workflow. I have just created a wishlist for the Python USD. So if, if you guys are interested, so we just looked into the API and everyone who joined any of my Python courses knows at the end of the day, it's literally just learn the basics of Python and then 
we we just start to to learn how to you know transform the functions and that into that. So everyone who also does the Python for Max will will know how to work with the C plus plus library because that's all, also the only thing that we get in there. And we also have this crash course from Bertrand, the USD crash course. If you find yourself you need a little bit more in depth of how to do USD outside of the scope of this event. Check this out. You can find the link here and also I throw it into the yeah. chat. And we are in the Q&A section. Before we dive in, into your guys' questions, I had an idea. I would like to ask a few questions by myself because that was the question that I came up when I started to look into USD. And I think maybe that will help us a little bit to clarify a few things that maybe you are bugged by. So, Metro, I will ask you. I'm the novice. I have no clue. So let, let's dive with the first question. USD versus the others. Does USD replace or organize all the other file formats like Alembic or OBJ? Where is it stands in the, in the middle of all of that? It replaces all the formats. Now, just be aware, USD supports some formats. So for example, if you use an Alembic and you load it into a stage, it will interpret the Alembic into USD. So you will end up with a proper USD. There are some formats that are not supported. So the .obj, for example, if I'm correct, is not supported. I think Alambic is, I don't know if FBX is, but usually every studio try to convert everything into USD to have USD files. So when you do a model, it becomes a USD. The reason for this is just that like USD try to optimize all the aspect so it's a, it's you know faster to use usd and it gives you more control you might find some studio because usd is open source so you might find some studios that have custom implementation to interpret some format that's possible i've never seen it so you know i'm not gonna say it exists Yes, also like in my research, I found like uh, Alembic is the one that is definitely in and Material X, but the rest is more of a kind of you need some extra, including OBJ. And as far as, as I know, FBX as well, it's not like default, but there is some options to transform that. Use the files. And then, I mean, you kind of answered that, but that was the question that I had basically just, just to yeah. kind of hammer down. Do you create one USD file or multiple files for each like layer, department, overlay, variation, and so on? So it depends. It depends how you want to work. You see the example I gave you with my scene right now, I have lighting, I have effects, I have environment, like it would be one layer per department. But it's up to you. If you want to have one USD that has everything baked into it, you can do it. It's not a problem for USD. It's not going to care. Should you do it? Definitely not. But in the meantime, should you have like 20 layers per asset? Definitely not either. So it's up to you. Opinions. How do you mix overrides on the same attribute at different levels? So in USD, there is a concept that is called liver piece. Liver piece is the strength ordering. So liver piece, there is local inherit variance references, payload specialized, which are all different process to make overrides in USD. And based on which one you're using, it's going to be stronger than the one under it. So usually opinions is basically the way to think about it that is a little easier is to go up and up and up and up. So if I'm, I work on a tree, I put this tree into this scatter, I do an override on the tree when, while I'm in the scatter, usually it's gonna, it's gonna work. If I go up, I do another override, it's gonna work and you keep on going. That's the easy way of thinking about it. With live RPs, it's a little more complex than that, but basically the overrides comes it, everything gets composed together, so the stronger win. Sometimes it's very confusing because you might do an override somewhere, but there is an override that comes after it, and now you don't understand why you're not getting the change. That's the magic of USD, but yeah, 
usually that's how you you work it was explained as kind of a photoshop layers but if, if it's for example the same attribute it's not like a merge it will literally be the the higher priority the yes. higher opinion will be yeah. completely overwriting the number it will not be a middle of something or whatever basically. no 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 it will completely if i'm cor i mean i i think maybe there are cases but i haven't seen it but it will completely override but the way it works is that let's say i do an override which override attribute a and attribute b and then i do another override after that that only override attribute b it will keep the a it will keep the override attribute A, it will just replace the attribute B. So it's really sparse. It's just take everything and it, you know, you put everything together. So there is some kind of merge, but when you do an opinion on something, it's not doing like addition or multiplication or whatever. That would be okay, super cool. messy. You know? <laughs> awesome. So let's do a final question from, from our side for the whole introduction and then guys, we go uh, over to your guys' questions. So you can also already kind of write them down. So last question, which I think is very important because we were talking so much about how great USD is and still complex and, you know, USD issues. What would you say is the biggest problem with USD on a day-to-day -day base, basically? On a day-to-day -day basis, I would say like comprehension. When you look at it, it seems complex. When you tr start to learn about it, it seems pretty easy. And then it goes back to complex once, once you get <laughs> used to it. So I would say the biggest issue is artists in general, you need to be a little technical and you need to understand how it works if you want to work with it. So I would say the biggest issue most of the time is comprehension. The other issue is that USD is so damn flexible that you can see the worst thing ever being made without knowing because USD is never going to complain. Like USD is magic. It never complains about anything, even if you do the worst thing. So you have to be very, very careful about how people do stuff because sometimes they will do weird things and it's, it can be really hard to track. So I would say that's the biggest issue, like too flexible. With great USD power come great USD responsibility, basically. Of course, yeah, yeah. So I think the best description of USD in terms of analogy is, especially for everyone who's a little bit more experienced in Python and programming, is Git. Git is super easy to use. It's just like, you know, if you do a, a add, commit, push, super simple, everyone can do it. You know, you can teach it everywhere. But when it comes to like, you know, branching and problems and all this moving around and stash and stack and whatever, that's when it really becomes complicated and very deep. So I think in USD is a little bit the same. It's it's It can be very superficial and easy to use, but then the deeper you go, the more it opens up and it becomes this very complex, but also, you know, flexible element. That's it from us. And now let's open up uh, the question for you guys. So if you have questions, just raise your hand and then we can take it away from there. We also have at least one question there in the chat. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm just going to answer quickly. Do you use USD for animation cache? Because we had problem with cache size in comparison to Alambic. I don't, have I checked? I think we use USD if I'm correct. I'm not sure. It depends on the studio, obviously. To be fair, if it works better in Alambic for you, you know, go ahead. Uh, like, because it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. But the thing with USD, as I said, is that there are a lot of ways of doing the same thing. So it might be worth just checking with Pixar if you have access to them. Like, maybe there is a way to do it better. I can tell you already, USD, when it comes to animation, rigging, this kind of stuff, not great. Like, it's great for a lot of stuff. Animation, rigging, not great. So that might be why. Even for the promise of performance with, uh, you know, multi-threading and uh, GPU. Yeah, no. Like, yeah. They are. Okay, it's very, yeah. it's but very I, confusing from a tech from Pixar to actually not be great in animation and rigging, but it wasn't okay. meant for all this so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with a great, so whatever I said in the beginning, is, see it as led to some of it as future plans, <laughs> especially as we just learned the performance part. 
So some of it we need to test out ourselves. Some of it is relative to your situation. And some of it is something that Pixar kind of announces as like performance is very important. And then maybe fails in some areas that are yet not to like to develop. But yeah, so I think the best way to, to see it is what Beto just said is basically just compare it. Two, two files next to each other, see which one is, is latency, opening, you know, just the, the thing. I think that that's, we're still at the stage where we need to compare until we get the data to say like, oh yeah, it's faster on this situation or faster on that situation. Yeah, absolutely. And when it comes to USD, I would always advise, test it and also test it with your renderer because every renderer has a different way of handling USD. So you yeah. have to be like very careful about how your renderer reacts to your USD because it might not be the same as a different company because they use another render. Hi, thank you very much for this conference. It was extremely interesting. I was curious how on a company's framework or pipeline, how a transition can be done from their existing system into a USD one. Is it smooth transition? Is it something easy to like put in place to implement? Or how did it work for DNEC, for example? So I wouldn't say it's a smooth transition, that's for sure. The thing is, it's when you're a huge studio, and I, all the huge studio I've, I've been working in, they always get to a point where they have a lot of you know pipeline that kind of try to resolve what USD is trying to resolve before. So it's usually for huge studio, it's it's a, it's quite a lot of work to get into USD because the, it means they have to change all the tools. Now USD made their life make development easier. That's for sure. But you can't like expect that 15 years of pipeline can be, you know, moved into USD in two months. That's never going to happen. And when once you get into USD, you will see that some stuff don't work the way you expect them to. So I would say for huge studio, it's a lot of work. If I was in a big, in a small studio or starting something, I would start with USD. That would be way easier. But moving to USD from a big studio, it's a lot of work. It's definitely a lot of work. And it's also because it's a, it's painful because artists don't know about USD. So pipeline might do some stuff. Then artists start to use it and, oh, but it doesn't work because we don't understand it. And also, in the end, USD is really new in production. It's been around for what, maybe three years, really, in production properly. Like, so we are still figuring out USD. Isn't there the possibility to kind of hide USD from the artist itself through like the pipeline tools at the end of the day? Sure, but it takes quite a bit of work to do that. But yes, absolutely. But the thing I mean, yeah, if they just just like pre press buttons to import, load, save, and yeah, sounds, you know, like it doesn't really matter which file that is. The thing is, the the most you hide from the artist, the most liberty to do things you remove from the artist too. So it's a balance. USD can be. I prefer having artists that understand USD and can work with it, so I don't have to do black box instead of doing black box. And once you have to do something different, it doesn't work which happens all the time in production because we always have to do something different. How does USD handle custom attributes when different DCC do things so differently? For example, Maya and Blender manage skin weights in completely different ways. Maya uses joint-based influences with weight paintings, while Blender uses vertex groups. When we transfer data between these applications using USD, does USD automatically map these different systems when transferring data between applications, or do we need to map it manually with scripts? No. Normally, if, if it has been done properly, that's what you would have to do before. But now you don't have to do this because the way it's supposed to work is that Maya and Blender will use the way USD map. So at the end of the day, you have a USD and Blender and Maya will take care of reading the USD properly so it works in their DCC. That's the way it's supposed to work, which is why we have way less work to do now because USD, the software takes care of interpreting the USD. Now, is it done in Blender? I don't know, 
I guess Maya is done because I think we use it, but in Blender, I don't know. It's up to the DCC to do the proper, you know, stuff with it. But since you work in a stage, it should be using USD. How it works generally is we have what we call schema. And the schema is like a way of describing a primitive in USD. And they might, if they have something really custom, they will just do a new schema for Blender that can be read in every other DCC. So that's why we have, for example, when you do shaders, you might have Arnold shaders, which are specific schema, but will be read everywhere. So that's how it's supposed to work. But again, it depends on the DCC. I mean, at the end of the day, it's what the plugin in the software does is just translate this information correctly to that thing, which that's, that's the idea. It's like, it's like, like the Qt.py trans, just a wrapper for all the PySite application, basically, PySite and PyQt yeah. application. But usually so, you work like, you work in a stage, so they take the data, like Houdini. Houdini, you will do like subcreate, which is just geometry data in Houdini, and it will be translated into USD. But that's not us who do who are doing that. That's Houdini who made the work. So they yeah. should be doing the same work. David. Yo, thank you for the talk. I just had a question. So we use USD in our studio, and I'm I'm an artist. So my biggest issue or the problem that I have is with the scene graph tree. Whenever we bring stuff in. I always have like different kind of naming coming in. And then when I have to publish it out, I have to get the naming right so that when it comes in again, everything lines up and it's in the right place. So I guess my question is like at the moment, today I spent so long just trying to get that right and eventually I had to ask for help. But is trial and error like the best way to go for this sort of thing? Or can I use Python to like, compare the pause and try and see if that's going to be easier or what would be your recommended like way to go about getting through that? What you're mentioning is if I have a structure like this, the way it works in USD is that if I wanted to override something, let's say I want to override the shader here, the way it would look. Oh yeah. My control key doesn't work anymore. Uh, so if I do this, and let's say I would do an override. That's not how you do it. I'm just showing you to make it easier. So it doesn't matter. I would do an override. It's going to override this primitive. OK, that's great, blah, blah. Now, if I change the name, that's not going to work. And the reason why it's not going to work is because now, as you can see, I have created a primitive that doesn't have the same name. So he's trying to override a primitive called effect mat b. But my primitive is called effect map. So I guess that's what you're mentioning. This kind of stuff is where you want to make automation for the artist. So for example, in our studio, whenever an artist brings an asset, we rename automatically the primitives to match the asset that he brings. So every time you bring them, they're going to come with like the proper name. We also have like structure. When you bring an asset like this, this comes with some kind of structure. So for example, we will have like maybe a root, maybe we will have a place where they are supposed to put the geometry, where they're supposed to put the look, that this kind of stuff. So I would say if you have a lot of issues with the namings and stuff, you can use Python because with Python, you can walk through the stage and do whatever is necessary. And you can also automate some process, you know, to make sure that the names are right, that you're overriding the, the good stuff. So yeah, it's a place where you should be doing automation and it's a place where you should be learning Python for these kind of changes. Saying that for years, learn Python, everyone. It's uh, essential. Awesome. There is just one question from Alexi about if I have a prim, is ah. there a way to find all the overrides applied to it and sourcing from where these overrides were grabbed? Kinda like so. If I have, if I take a prim, for example, in Houdini, you have what we call the layer stack. And I was saying everything is a layer in USD. And the layer stack is what I have here is basically telling me for this primitive what 
layer are contributing to what this primitive is right now. So here I've done, I'm doing an override. I'm not doing anything, but I'm adding an override. And you can see that I have now this layer added, and I also have the layer, which the which is the FX shader layer, and it tells me where this layer come from. So any override will show up as a, like a layer in the stack. And how you find which one is writing something? Well, you go in the scene graph layer, and you go check the layer, and you can read the USD, or you can check like what the USD is doing, and you know guess from there. That's my answer. It's not like we make tools to help with this in general in USD because USD is very you can have overrides everywhere, so it's a pain in the ass. But that's one way of doing it. It's up to you to make tools to help you with that. Thank you for answering. Uh, it was uh, the question was more about uh, Python way to do it. So can I do the same with the Python? Same thing. Uh, we have a lot of um, like entities in this process. Uh, same same thing. So here I'm showing you by with the window. If you were in Python, how you would do it is that you would get the primitive in question. You would get the layer stack, and from the layer stack, you would see like you could traverse them, find the overrides and stuff. Now, this is not like doing something like this is definitely like intermediate slash advanced Python USD, but it's it's doable for sure. That's also why you should always have you know a nice structure in USD, just so you don't have to around to try to find like where which layer is doing some change on your scene any kind of encouraging words and <laughs> going into this topic basically if i were an artist today i would definitely put usd as a priority to learn and i think it's it can be it's it's hard usd honestly i won't say it's easy but you don't need to know much to be able to work with it so I would definitely advise everyone to have a look at it, try to understand it because it's really something important in production now. It's definitely not as bad as learning Houdini. So, you know, go, go for USD if you have to choose. It's probably a better selling point. If you're a small studio and you have to work doing some pipeline stuff, I would advise you to go on USD. It's going to make your life way easier probably in terms of development. So, yeah, that's my advice. Yeah, and just as a side comment, you, you don't have to download the repository at the moment. There, Some of the software already have it in the newer versions. I think, for far as I can see, Maya has it since 2022, from what I see here. So there is the Maya USD plugin, for example. But not sure how good it works, but it is there. There are already ways, even as an artist, to dive into the topic besides what we just talked about from like example scenes, but also some software already has it as, as a default plugin installed, like Alembic. You know, we also had that before. Okay, that's basically it. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and thank you, especially Vetron, for doing that with us, giving us a little bit of an insight into this relatively complex topic, at least from, from a point of view of, you know, it's still a little bit uncharted territory. And honestly, from my experience diving into this topic myself, it, it is pretty horribly documented in terms of uh, like starting. Like I really had my problems of reading. I, I was opening like 10 pages at the same time and every beginner page was this long sentence. And then it was like, I still don't get it. But basically piecing things together. NVIDIA has a few examples. There is one video by Foundry about USD. So adding with all that really helped me to also understand it myself, but also just downloading a scene, just using it, looking at it, playing around with it is just the best way to get into this topic, I would say. So basically that is the recommendation. Everyone, thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much for being here. Petro, thank you very much for having you after meeting you at the FMX. And you, you kind of gave me the buck of USD. It's like, hey, Alex, you should do USD. So Sorry. I, like, hey, <laughs> I, I bring you into that. No, because it's perfect, because I, we, we can hear it everywhere. And one of the things that I recommend and, and through the last podcast that I did and everything I, I heard, 
USD is like it's not expected for you to be to know USD at the moment, but it is it is preferable if you know it. So if you d dive into bigger companies like DNEG, like Framestore, like Animal Logic, they are usually not yet expect you to be experienced in USD. But if you come with experience, if you like, you know, open scenes, understand the basics, and can talk about it. It's definitely a bonus, I think. Oh yeah, uh, at yeah. The moment. If you say that you know a little bit about USD, it's it's good. It's a good selling point. So basically, it's also a good way to add a little bit to your resume. Besides things like Python, for example, as an artist, I think that's the uh, the idea here. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining. It was a pleasure having you all here. I welcome you to join us live and also watch the previous episodes. And I'll see you on our next TT meetup.